the next panel, which is a very interesting panel. It has to do with Africans living and studying in Israel as an asset. And uh, Joey Lowe founded IDC, founded IDC Herzliya, actually, in addition to uh, Israel at Heart. Um, Joey's one of our founders. He established, folks, if we can have your attention, please take your seats. Please don't make noise. Please have respect for the next session. Glad to see the right-hand side here is full of people. Good. All right. We're no longer talking about corruption, so it's less interesting, I guess. All right. So, I'm going to start all over again. This session is about Africans living and studying in Israel, and the question is, is it an asset for Israel or not? This session is uh, sponsored by Israel at Heart by Joey Lowe, who recently I've called the Albert Schweitzer of African Affairs in Israel. And uh, Joey founded Israel at Heart in 2002, as a nonprofit organization whose single concern is the well-being of the State of Israel. And at Israel at heart, what Joey always likes to uh, promote is a better understanding of Israel and its people. He always loves to explain that he's not some other conventional Jewish organization, nor does he represent any governmental body or political party, and therefore, Joey and those he supports are able to express themselves freely with uh, no constraints uh, whatsoever. And it's really interesting to see how uh, Israel at Heart evolved. At first, there were groups which Joey sent uh, overseas to make the case for Israel at a time when there were a lot of Israel bashers in the world during the time of the Second Intifada. And then came a second wave of Zionism on the part of uh, Joey Lowe. He walked in one day to IDC Herzliya with a suggestion that unlike many academic institutions in the country, we should do something to absorb Ethiopian Jewry um, in the state of Israel in academia. And he established a program here where dozens upon dozens of Ethiopian Jews, most of whom were officers in the IDF, have come to study at IDC Herzliya, have become top lawyers, clinical psychologists, business persons, members of the foreign ministry, members of the Ministry of Defense, and many, many other professions, and made a huge impact in that many of these individuals who graduated at IDC Herzliya are also role models. Now, in the past couple of years, Joey has focused his energy and resources on defeating the government's deportation policy. And over the last nine years, the organization has provided more than 40 full scholarships to young refugees, asylum seekers, who were looking to receive a higher education in the state of Israel. And I can tell you that Joey has been a, a lone voice, a lone voice. And if we take a look at the humanistic Zionism of Theodor Herzl and Vladimir Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin. This is the humanistic Zionism that we were always taught that it's a, a country by the people, for the people, with the minority in mind, and always thinking in terms of those who need assistance. And Joey piles onto this equation the fact that he comes from a family of Holocaust survivors and always mentions the fact that when his family was fleeing Europe, there was uh, no one around uh, to help them. And I have never seen in my life a more dedicated person than Joey Lowe. Lately, I've yep. coined this phrase. 
It's been traveling around the Congo and Rwanda and Zambia lately, finding many, many more new students to, for IDC. These don't happen to be asylum seekers, the ones from those countries. The folks up here do happen to be. These are also wonderful people. He's basically converted me to his cult, to his sect, and I've adopted his religion. I now call him the Albert Schweitzer <laughs> of IDC Herzliya and the State of Israel. Joey, I promise to keep this short, but I love you dearly and it's very difficult to uh, introduce you. I don't think I've ever introduced you before. We've known each other for many years. So I love you and my hugs and the floor is yours. today um, because I'm sure once you know them and you compare it to the things that people read about the community, um, it will enlighten you, it will lift your hearts and your spirits like it does for me every time I meet them. And uh, the first thing we'll do is introduce the students. Please give your name, age, the country of origin you came from, and the field of study. Okay. My name is Alhaji Alfafufana from, uh, my name is Alhaji Alfafufana from the Ivory Coast. And I came to Israel 2006, and I'm 39, married with two kids. And uh, I left my country during the deadly civil war. And it was not uh, actually a place that I, I think I have to stay to wait for a long civil war that I don't know when it's going to end. And with all the dreams I have, so I decided to leave and come to Israel. Yeah. My name is Melat, Melat Michael. I'm uh, 21 years old. I'm half Ethiopian and half Eritrean. I came here when I was 10 years old, 2008. And I'm the first year student uh, in uh, IDC. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to IDC, but also Joey for moderating this session. Uh, my name is Mutasim Ali, uh, originally from Darfur, Sudan. Uh, I'm 32. Um, I live in Israel for the past 10 years. Um, I'm holding Israeli residency status. Um, I studied law at the College of Law and Business in Ramat Gan, and I just got accepted to George Washington, uh, George Washington University to do my master's in law. By the way, he studied in law in Hebrew. By the way, Milat speaks Hebrew, it's like almost a first language, and Monim over there as well. I said if I was somehow found in the Sudan, I'd be hiding in my closet. I don't think I'd be able to <laughs> learn Arabic and speak it well enough to study it and to graduate in law school in Hebrew is quite an accomplishment. So, hi, everybody. It's really an honor to be here. My name is Muni Maroon. I'm from uh, Sudan, Darfur. Uh, I came in Israel at the age of 23. And now I study at Hebrew University, political science and business on my second year. We can go one by one and find out why did you leave your home country? Okay. For, um, where are your family members, uh, those who aren't here or some are here, and um, what are they doing now? Okay. First of all, before going to the question, I would like to say first, uh, Thank you to Joy that I did my undergraduate at IDC and graduate as an interactive communication student and currently doing my master in organizational behavior, which is really a blessing for me. That I think without Joy, this will have not happened. Yeah. So I left my country, as I said previously, in 2006 during the deadly uh, civil war in the Ivory Coast, and it was really intense and difficult situation for me to stay because I lost my father and, many, and most of my family in the war. And my mom and two siblings, they fled to Guinea and where they are currently living. And uh, I was uh, lucky to escape to uh, Mali and uh, end up in uh, Egypt. And Egypt was the only country that uh, I have access to by then. And then, what was the good news in the whole neighborhood of Israel here is the only country that was recommended to go to in, during 2006 because they are the only one that receive refugees and treat them with humanity and uh, give them access to whatever was available for them by then. Till 2012, when things changed 
and then they start to push the situation, make it very difficult for people. But in 2006, it was the best place for asylum seekers. Yeah. I left my home country when I was four. I was, uh, I was four years old. I left there with my family to Sudan. I lived in uh, Sudan for six years. And then all the mascara started, so we couldn't uh, stay there. And then we started the journey uh, to Israel. Uh, I didn't know that by then. Uh, I was told that we are going to go for some kind of a travel or something. And then I ended up being here. So my parents did the choice to come here. And I have three little brothers. Uh, currently, they are living in Ethiopia with my mother. Uh, my father died on the way, so yeah, I lived here for six years in uh, Beta Shanti, and now I'm here. Um, so, um, as many of you are familiar with um, Darfur, um, Darfur is a region in western part of Sudan, and this region is going through genocide and ethnic cleansing until today. Um, over 500,000 people were murdered only because of who they are, not because of any crimes they have committed. And my family and I had to separate in 2003 when I was 16. They had to flee to the north. They live in displaced persons camp within Darfur until today. And I moved to the south and in the end I ended up in Israel. That's a long journey. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But. Uh, but uh, part of the reason why genocide is taking place is because the central government in Sudan, under Bashir back then, he was uh, now ousted by the people, but still um, there is no freedom and democracy in Sudan. Um, their main idea was to change the racial identity of the region Darfur from um, African majority to Arab majority. Uh, so that's part of the reason why uh, I had to leave the country, basically because of racial persecution and political persecution. Good. So because my story is pretty similar to Mutasim's one, so I would rather to say mine in Hebrew. So I hope that everyone is, understand Hebrew here. As Bedomela uh, Masha Mutasim Amar, אני נולדתי גם בדארפור, שזה אזור שמתבצע בו רצח חם, לצערי הרב, עד היום. נפרדתי מהמשפחה שלי בשנות, בתחילת שנות אלפיים, שאז התחיל הרצח חם. עברתי לאזור אחר, הם נשארו באזור שכיום הם תחת שליטת המורדים. חלקם עברו למחנות עקורים בתוך דארפור. ואני עברתי לאזור אחר, ושם התחלתי לימודים עד האוניברסיטה, ולאחר מכן, כשהייתי באוניברסיטה, התחלתי להיות פעיל פוליטי, ולכן צרדתי בהתחלה רצח חם, ולאחר מכן נרדפתי בגלל הפעילות הפוליטית שלי בתוך סודאן, ונאלצתי לצאת מהמדינה. הגעתי לכיוון מצרים, ואז בזמנו... לא יכלתי להישאר שם ולהגיש בקשת מקלט שם בגלל ש... שמורסי היה שם, היו יחסים מאוד טובים בין הממשל בסודאן ומצרים ולכן אה... האופציה היחידה שנשארה לי היא ללכת לכיוון הדמוקרטיה היחידה במזרח תיכון שזו ישראל. Um, so when um, refugees and asylum seekers started coming to Israel was uh, back in 2005. And because then there was no fence, uh, many refugees and asylum seekers, mainly from Eritrea and Sudan, decided to come to Israel. But also we have others from Western African countries, such as Ivory Coast, uh, we have from uh, uh, Sierra Leone on, and most of the Af Western African countries. Until of 2011, there were about 1,700 people coming per month. And they're for different reasons, but mostly because of the unrest in their countries of origin. Until of 2012, there were about 64,000 refugees and asylum seekers. Today, we have 33,000 
African asylum seekers. You might wonder, where did the have go? Um, and we can talk about it more, uh, about the policy and what drove people to leave Israel. But today we have 33,000 uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, the vast majority uh, is from Eritrea. And the, uh, the other half, uh, or the other small minority from Sudan, but few from Western African countries. It is important to mention that there is another wave of um, asylum seekers, and I'm carefully saying this, because there were some from uh, uh, former Soviet Union states. They are coming to Israel through the Ben Gurion airport, and they are still seeking asylum from Mexico, from Egypt, and all in total, there are 66,000 asylum seekers who are non-Africans non who are still in Israel. What are the um, jobs of most of the Africans who are performing here in Israel? Monim. Monim. What is that? Oh, take the first part and then yeah. 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 The the what are most of the jobs that people are, who are performing here in Israel, the Africans? Yeah, so the African, the Africans asylum seekers, uh, the jobs that they are doing here is mostly the jobs that the Israelis uh, don't doesn't do it. So it's nanny skills uh, works, uh, uh, dishes cleaners, uh, street cleaners, and all the jobs that Israelis don't like to do it. Hotels, restaurants. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. Certainly, yes, most of the jobs that is, you know, uh, cleaning restaurants and hotels and all of that. But uh, you might ask, why is that? And part of the reason is, uh, is that most of refugees and asylum seekers who are living in Israel, they uh, hold a temp uh, conditional release visa, which means people are conditionally released from a uh, detention facility and that as soon as the government decides to deport them back, it can, do, uh, it can do so. And so this document states clearly it does not constitute a work permit. שלוקחים 20% מהשכר החודשי של מבקשי המקלט והם מקבלים את זה ברגע שהם עוזבים את הארץ כיום אני ידוע שכאילו לא כולם מקבלים את הכסף רציתי רק להסביר שזה ממש משפיע בחיי היום של משפחות. And this really has such a detrimental effect on the lives of families and bachelors, unmarried people, especially children, who grow up without even time to really talk and communicate with their families, because all day long they are in various sort of educational frameworks and summer camps and summer things so because the parents need to leave their children in some kind of frameworks because they're doing double shifts, the parents, in order to finance themselves and their families. And very often it happens that women don't have the possibility to learn and study anything because they sometimes they need to be with the children if they're not working. And that's it, basically. Fields. The Filipinos are home givers. There are uh, Chinese people in Israel helping to build the roads. These are all migrant workers who are brought in specifically to do jobs that um, they feel aren't going to be filled by the local people. Here, this is the case of people who came in through the border in Sinai, and they are the only ones who are charged with this 20% deposit tax. In addition to the 20%, there's 16% that's taken from the employer. There was a report yesterday from Kavlo Ved that said there are hundreds of millions of dollars in accounts supposedly held for the Africans. They didn't get it. And in addition, many of the employers who deduct the 20% never put it into the account. They just use the 20% as a discount for them uh, on the workers. What I wanted to say about the Picadon, Deposit law. 
is that perhaps you're asking why this was actually legislated in the first place. Based on what the members of Knesset claimed uh, that started and legislated this, it was in order to encourage the asylum seekers to leave Israel and to go back to their own countries of origin. What I wanted to say was that there's a problematicism embedded in the diagnosis of the actual problem and in the law. In other words, the government thinks, or at least it wants to claim, that the main reason that asylum seekers are here in Israel is because of money and work. What I wanted to say, based on these figures, is that the law from 20, started in 27, but it didn't encourage people to leave because the problem is not the money. If you have a choice between money and life, then of course you'll choose to stay alive. And that caused so many other problems, like Milat said, that families simply do not succeed in existing. I mean, not even a, we're talking about a basic conditions. As it is, they get a basic minimal wage, and then they take 20% off that, and in addition to that, another 16%. And from the very beginning, we knew very well that they wouldn't go back to the actual asylum seekers, and we don't know where that money goes to. left when she was five. She left Berlin, lived in Belgium for seven years, in Cuba, uh, France before that, and then came to America as a 15-year-old. And I was raised in a home. My dad was from Austria. But when I met these students, I felt it was my opportunity to give back to them the things that my parents you know, taught me growing up about what Jewish values are, what does it mean to be a Jew. And I went to yeshiva for 12 years. And it's particularly painful to me to get to know the group and then see how the Israeli government presents them as, you know, robbers, rapists in the most horrible terms instead of embracing them and welcoming them. And we'll discuss how they can be such an asset for Israel if only Israel would use its mind and its brain in a more positive way. We were talking before about corruption in the uh, Israeli government. This is one more example where the compassion, there's no humility, there's there's an, an effort to use them as a scapegoat for many of their own problems. And again, as a Jew, I, I am a little bit very ashamed that Israel as a country doesn't stand up and rally behind saying, this is what we demand of our people. Thank you. Uh, El Haji, do you want to talk a little bit about the treatment you received in Israel and access to health insurance because you have two children? Yes. <laughs> It's a pleasure to talk about it. Um, as Joy said, there are a lot of good people in Israel here. Till 2012, I have a, an amazing treatment from friends of Israel and even with a lot of uh, activists. And, but, but let me talk about this. Because as soon as the government try to use the refugees for their political gain, and then everything become upside down. And what happened in 2012, the government lifted all the protection for refugees, mostly the, uh, the Ivorian. So we fall into that category. And within that time, we lose all our right to insurance, no bank account, and uh, we have limited access to, uh, to many things. And what happened on the insurance issue, some of the, the family members Thank God with, uh, how we call it, Mukedet, because there are still some organization here who are fighting very hard to help the refugees. So Mukedet Insurance Company took this upon themselves. They said, okay, all parents who have a child here, so we are ready to give insurance under your child's name. So this is how some of us, we are lucky to get an insurance. But what about those people who, who don't have family without children here? They left without insurance, and they got sick, nowhere to go. Some of them, uh, there is a clinic, a medical uh, center in a, a central bus station. They usually help them to give them a first aid uh, treatment. But it's not enough if you have 
uh, an intensive uh, treatment to do, which is very expensive, and uh, they can't afford it. So most of them end up uh, leaving the country because of uh, those challenges that uh, they face. Yeah. When the government wanted to deport uh, the Africans, one of the means they used was to place them in Khulot, which is a detention camp yeah. in Saronin. And just to point out, Munim, how many years did you spend in jail? Almost three years. I have been in, in Saronim, which, which is a, a closed jail for 18 months. Then I, I have uh, been transferred to Kholot Detention Center for uh, another year. So, and Mutasim? It depends on, um, uh, does it include the journey from Sudan or just Israel? Because that can be a lot more. Um, but in Israel, I've been uh, for uh, over two years. Um, in the beginning, I was uh, in the Saharanim in the south of Israel. And I think I really didn't complain about the prison in the south because, you know, uh, perhaps it was a screening place. I thought maybe it's a place where they can review my, my claim, whether I really deserve a refugee status or not. But that wasn't the case. Uh, the second time was a little frustrating because it was for the Holod detention facility. It was basically designed to make it as difficult as possible for refugees and asylum seekers to be in Israel. Just like the former Minister of Interior named Eli Shai, who said uh, the purpose is to make their life miserable. And so I was there for, uh, uh, for 14 months. Um, but in any case, um, with that, we really hold no hostile uh, you know, views about Israel. Because in the end, uh, as much as we disagree with the uh, laws and the policies and all of that we compiled with it because it's, you know, it's a democratic country. But then, on the other hand, you've got this uh, bigger society who, you know, protested every day to say that this is not the country that we want to see. And, um, and this is one of the greatest things that we definitely will talk about it before we finish the panel. What's been the most frustrating and disappointing thing about, you know, during your stay here in Israel? Want to start with him? Yes, I think one of them is maybe it's a bit ridiculous, but that they didn't agree to teach me Hebrew while I was in prison. You see, like I spent three years in prison and they refused to teach me Hebrew because if they did, I would have started my university since 2015. So this is one actually. And other reasons are that I'm a little bit disappointed because. We expect, as refugees from Israel, to be uh, like treat us differently. And especially Israel. Why? Because of the Jewish history. Like, they, they, the Israelis should be the one who understand deeply what it means to be a refugee and what it means to be, to, to be abused based on your uh, ethnicity or based on what you are. So... So, because of our high expectations that we had on Israel, that we have uh, like a, a bigger disappointment on Israel. But again, I'm, I'm saying this, and always I'm saying this, that I personally do not blame is Israel for their treatment, because I think the responsibility to, to like, uh, from, for me to be protected is the responsibility of my country, the country that I came from, and not Israel. So in my country, they wanted to kill me, to eliminate me, but in Israel, they rejected or denied uh, me a uh, status uh, for refugees, and I think this is, there's a huge dif difference. We cannot compare. Melat? Uh, the... I didn't get a job. בכיתה י"א, 
ממש רציתי כאילו להתגייס ולתרום בחזרה למדינה. Because I wanted to be recruited and give back to the country that ultimately did give me such security and did accept me ultimately. And that really upset me. It really was against my grain. Because I've been here, I feel like an Israeli. I've been here for 11 years. My native language is the Hebrew. I lived in Beit Shanti, which is a Jewish home. And I celebrated and even had my bat mitzvah at the age of 12 and celebrated all the high holidays. And that was the thing that was against my grain the most. And I think I went to the Scouts movement and I took everything to, more, to heart and all the way. And from a very early age at grade five, grade six, I had that real desire to join the army and to give back to society, but because of my status and where I came from, I wasn't able to give back. And Al-Haji said to him, well, you don't have one, and we may have to leave very shortly, because coming from the Ivory Coast, it's much more dangerous than from even Darfur or Eritrea. And he said to the kids, well, we might have to leave and go back to Africa. And his son said, Dad, do they celebrate Hanukkah in <laughs> Africa? I remember that. Yeah, exactly, yes. That's what he said. And also he asked me, uh, when you go there, are we going to learn in school in Hebrew or in or which language? Because I don't want to learn in any other language without uh, Hebrew. <laughs> Only in Hebrew I want to study. You know, it's so amazing. But uh, let me go back to the topic. Like the most frustrating uh, part here is Israel failed to give us the freedom to contribute to the Israeli society. Because with all what we've achieved here, I believe if they give us the freedom to, to implement this, will be a, an uh, asset or contributory factor to Israel to extend this to Africa where it's highly needed today because Israel is one of the startup nations and high-tech nations which Africa needs all what Israel is doing. But they don't give that freedom. And most of us will have this idea of work and studied very hard, we've achieved this, but they didn't give us the freedom to get involved into this issue. They don't give us the, uh, the working permit to do internship, to learn and how to collaborate, how to take Israel uh, uh, high tech or Israel company to Africa. Yeah, it's one of the believe, most frustrating part. Yeah. What do you believe is Israel's greatest strength and some of the impressions that you have uh, after living here for the amount of time you have? You want to start with Hassan? Uh, okay, so now I want to just say a little thing um, for the uh, previous question. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, if you remember, I spoke about the uh, story of Darfur. And I have to say, this is one of the reasons why I'm in Israel today. When we were in the midst of a genocide, hardly anyone from around the world was there to speak for the people of Darfur. People totally ignore us. We were confronting a very strong government supported by China, Russia, and most of the Arab states political support through the Arab League, financial support, and we, fought, we felt so lonely. But then, the people that stood with us were Jews, diaspora. They marched to DC. They were lifting signs that you will not walk alone, we will walk with you. And, and that for me was one of the reasons why I felt Israel would be a safe place contrary to countries like Egypt or Libya. I just learned that the Egyptian ambassador was here yesterday. Uh, I would have come if I knew uh, to confront him about this. But anyway, um, and that's part of the frustration, in fact, coming to Israel, knowing that Israel would be a safe place. But then you see people are being treated as infiltrators, posing threat, national threat to the Israeli demographic uh, course. Uh, but in the end, I'm sure, um, uh, you know, um, personally, I'm blessed to, to be here. I'm really privileged uh, to be here to achieve my potential. I wouldn't have uh, expected to, to get to this level, finishing my law school, and I'm a potential um, 
um, master's student at the George University, one of the greatest universities in America. And, um, and I think one of the greatest things about Israel is that you can always express your views. Think about it. When the Holod detention facility was erected back in 2013, we, people who do not have um, proper status, we were able to protest in the heart of Tel Aviv. Over 20,000 people speaking freely, saying the policy of the government does not befit the values of the state of Israel. This would never have happened anywhere in Africa or in the countries and region. I'll give you an example. In Jordan in 2015, 1,800 Darfuris were deported back to Khartoum directly only because they protested for their rights. This is not the case in Israel. My frustration is that Israel, there, uh, there is a place that we can improve things. There, always there is a chance. This is one of the really strength, uh, 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 strong uh, points of Israel. Always there is an opportunity to make it a better place. Did we say that there are no... Because of the fence that's been built around Israel, there have been no people coming. No more into people Israel today. Since Absolutely. And the end of Zero. Right. So nobody has come in. So it's really a question of how do we treat the 30,000 who are here? How do we give them the opportunity to stay as long as they can before they're able to go back home? Um, Elijah, you want to talk a little about ASO? That's the African Student Organization that was established by the students. Um, this is uh, two years ago. Yeah, uh, three years ago. Yeah, but, yeah. We started uh, three years ago, but uh, to be really active was two years ago. And uh, what happened here is because we got tired of fighting that we are refugee and we are not refugees, refugee and not refugee, and this is time consuming. And we realized that that a lot of people in the community that have a high potential to improve. And we came together. We decided to create this amazing group when we met in, uh, at IDC in 2015, six years off, we, we create a, a, an organization called uh, African Student Organization to help ourselves achieve our dream and also to reach out the community that want to achieve their, their higher education. And uh, that's the time we met with uh, Joy, amazing, and he gave us the hope, okay, I heard your story and I'm really inspired about it. And you guys are really amazing and you want to achieve your dream and I'm here, I'm stand for you. Go for whatever and I'm here to support you. And immediately, second year, we raised up to 22 students at IDC. Majority will have uh, 13 students at IDC and, uh, and eight students at uh, other uh, public universities uh, in, in Israel. And uh, today we have 42 students 19 studying at IDC and others in uh, different uh, public uh, uh, universities in Israel. And we create a very cohesive uh, relationship with them to make sure that we achieve uh, this dream. Yeah. We don't and have the, much time and left. Let me add some. Yeah. Let me just add. And the good thing about this group is we have a diverse uh, group of African students that we create a good relationship to help ourselves and to make sure that we go back to Africa and, uh, and be an ambassador for, for our country to change the corruption that's going on there. Uh, if you want to yeah. talk for a second about your long-term plans mm. and a takeaway message you'd like to leave to the audience. Good. So, I will... Okay, I'm going to continue with what Elijah said. I think that here there's something very essential that the government, essential that the government seems to be missing out on. And perhaps the audience and those who can hear will perhaps help us by telling the government that we're not just refugees, we are human beings and we have potential. Most of us here are students in the Institutes of Higher Learning here in Israel, and each and every one of us have hope that things will change in our own countries of origin and we'll be able to build a democracy there so that no one else will have to undergo the path that we have walked upon, in other words, and the suffering that we suffered and those conditions that we had to live in. And I agree with what Nadja said. 
Al-Haji said, Israel is missing out on something very important. Most of the African countries are not developed, and Israel has the capability of actually helping those countries. There's a common denominator denominator between Israel and the African countries. Most of the people that are here want to promote those interests, and we can actually help promote the interests of Africa, and vice versa. We have a very short time. Um, first of all, um, I think it is important for Israel to absorb refugees and asylum seekers because this is what Israel is based on, um, but also refugees and asylum seekers can be an asset to this state. Uh, our long-term, uh, not our, my uh, long-term plan, uh, hopefully soon there will be uh, change in Sudan. I'll be able to go back and um, Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. And what I would like to ask of you in the audience is to truly think about what we said. Take it in earnest. And that doesn't mean, hey, demonstrate with us. Um, against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. But please convey our message for us. And if you do have an opportunity to talk about these subjects, and I know that we hear a lot about it on the media, it's, it's not all accurate. So what you heard, please, Please convey our message and correct people when they say erroneous things. To join people like Joy Lo and IDC. I will say again IDC because Jonathan Davis in 2015, he's the first one who said IDC is the only one that receives refugees that break the border from Sinai and we re receive them at IDC here and we give them education. So I think we should be proud of them and make sure that everyone join them to give a better education to Africans. I thank you all. And I just yeah. want to add something, and then I promised Mutasim he'd have the last word is, yeah. one of the problems that we face is BDS all around the world. I'm telling you from my experience, if we sent Africans to speak around the world, mm. they could speak far better than any white Israeli can, because they know themselves how they were treated in their own country. I, I said, we have a whole group of Ethiopian Israeli students that I sent to around America, and when it came to issues of discrimination and racism, they did a much better job than anyone else could do. And they could argue as black people. And unfortunately, you know, we can't do that. Um, so this is a group that if we, instead of pushing them out, welcomed them and gave them the permission to travel, gave them a document that they could return to Israel, they would be a huge asset for, for Israel. Mutasim. One last word, one last word. Um, all of the successes that we have made so far, all of us, it wouldn't have happened without Joey. Joey is a true essence of what Israel is for. This is, this is the Israel that everyone wants to see. I want to say really thank you, Joey, and without you, none of this would have been possible. Thank you, Joey. Thank you so much. Thank you.